The following is a message from Crossroads Church, a grace-centered community in central Alberta, Canada. Well, good morning and welcome to Crossroads Church. You know, I, um, I appreciated the worship this morning. It was kind of country and kind of southern gospel, I guess. And, um, you know, it's one of the great miracles to me of the Christian life is that God can actually use country music and southern gospel. But he does, apparently. Um, even Cammie was up here with her cowboy boots on. I, I got told this week it was some kind of a cowboy Sunday. I had no idea. But um, I was away for the week and look what happens. Um, you know, one of the particular challenges that somebody like me faces on a Sunday like this is when Ken asks us to actually clap and sing. That's a problem. I can clap and I can sing, but to try and bring it together, that's tough for somebody like me. So I try and sit in the corner on these kind of Sundays where I can't be seen. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, it was, uh, it was a good Sunday. I was asked by somebody this week this question. If you could have lunch with anybody in the world, who would it be? And I thought about that all week. And I don't know what you would say, but um, try to figure that out. If I could have lunch with anybody in the world, who would it be? I've already had lunch with Rob Tannehill, so I was able to take him off the list. Um, I wondered about Jimmy Carter. I thought, I would love to have lunch with a guy in his mid-80s or maybe late 80s and ask him, how is it that you never retired? How come you're not off with a motorhome and golf balls down south? How come you're, um, you're still going full out for God's kingdom? You're not, you're not kind of just doing your thing and collecting seashells. What makes you tick and do what you do? I would love to ask that question. It's bothered me why so many people check out when they get 55 and over. But in prime time for the kingdom. So I would ask him that question if I could have lunch with him. And then I thought I'd love to have lunch with Billy Graham, wouldn't you? He's still around, still in his right mind. That guy, he must have thousands of stories. Wouldn't it be incredible to sit and just listen to Billy Graham and the God stories that he could just unpackage? I don't know who you'd pick. I, I don't know if those would be the two I'd pick, but... They'd be up there. But I also thought about what, what if you could have lunch with anybody that's ever lived? Who would you pick? That's a different question, isn't it? Anybody that's ever lived, who would you have lunch with? I don't know the answer to that question for me, but I know near the top of the list would be the three people I want to talk to you about today whose story is in Daniel chapter 3. They're absolutely remarkable, outstanding young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're going to talk about them, and we're going to listen to their story in Daniel chapter 3. If you ever had an opportunity to have lunch with these three guys, I'm sure your life would never be the same again. Now, just before we get into this story in this chapter, let me remind you of two very important facts about the book of Daniel that you really need to know to get the most out of Daniel 3. One is this, that Daniel is a book primarily about God. Not first about Daniel, not Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego, but first it's a book about God. And what we've discovered as we've looked at it is we learned about God that he's sovereign. That means above all, over everything, in control, kind of letting history go the way it ought to go according to his purposes and plan. But we've also learned that he's imminent. That means up close and personal. Those two things we've learned about God. In chapter 2, his sovereignty is on display where you see him over all the kingdoms of the world and playing out history the way it should go as Lord of the history. He's in control of that. But then in chapter 3, you see him intimately involved in the affairs of three young men, his people's lives. Chapter 2, it's his great wisdom that's on display. In chapter 3, it's his power. So that's the first thing you need to know. Daniel's, first of all, a book about God. Second thing you should know is that the book addresses a very basic but relevant question. The question the book addresses is this. How are God's people to live in an ungodly world? That's a very good question. 
How are God's people, or put it this way, how are Christ followers to live in a world that rejects Christ? It's a good question because it's hard to be a Christian. Have you ever discovered that? It's not easy being a Christian. Being a Christian makes you different. Being a Christian makes you stand out in the crowd because of your beliefs and values and practices. It's hard to be a Christian. So the relevant question of Daniel is how does a Christian make it in a world that's not Christian? The answer that this part of the book gives, the first six chapters give, is the answer is a Christian lives faithfully, faithfully. But what does that mean to live faithfully? And what does it really look like Monday to Friday, Saturday and Sunday as well? That's the exact question Daniel 3 will answer. It will tell you what it looks like to live faithfully in a real world. So I want to take you to this chapter. And I think what we'll do is this. I'll read bits of it to you. We'll just walk through the story because I hope that um, when you're done, you feel like you've lived it. And then at the end, I'll come back to that question And we'll try and answer the question, so what does it look like to live faithfully? Let me read you the first seven verses. They go like this. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned a whole bunch of people, the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you're commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, even country, you must fall down. And worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound, here it goes again, of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those three guys had lost their homeland. They were exiles in Babylon. They'd lost their families. Their very names and identity had been changed. But apparently, they hadn't lost their God, and their faith is still intact. So one day, the story goes, Nebuchadnezzar decided to make an image. We're not told how long after the events of chapter 2. Probably a while had elapsed. This thing was impressive. It was like 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And it was all gold, at least um, the outside was all gold. It probably wasn't enough gold or enough money in Babylon to make the whole thing a solid gold. And the text is, um, well, I think it's deliberately vague about what the statue represents. Is it a god? An idol? Is it... um, Is it of Nebuchadnezzar himself? And the jury seems to be out on what it really was. I think it represented Nebuchadnezzar for a couple of reasons. In chapter 2, he's had this dream of this great image, and the head was the gold. And Daniel said, you're the gold head. And all these other kingdoms that come after you, they're less than you. They were silver, bronze, iron, clay, as the statue went down. But I think Nebuchadnezzar, being the king of the world, thought, wouldn't it be incredible if the whole thing was gold? I mean, really, wouldn't it be incredible if my kingdom would last forever? So he builds this incredibly big statue, not just the head, but the whole thing gold now. And it seems to me that later in the story, when these three guys don't bow down to it, that he takes it personally as a personal affront to himself. Probably it was a statue that represented Nebuchadnezzar. And you'll notice that these phrases get repeated in this chapter. Now, if we read the whole chapter, we'll look at it. But you'll notice phrases that get repeated, like all the people groups or the leaders, satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates. That repeats in this chapter. 
And then the musical instruments that are played when people are supposed to bow down. It's, um, what is it? Flute, zither, horn, harp, lyre, pipes, and all kinds of music. That's repeated four times. Why? Well, it's, it, there's a literary artist writing this stuff. And by repeating these phrases, he's actually building the tension in the chapter so that you get this point. Everybody, everywhere, without exception, is bowing down to this statue. I mean, everybody's doing it. Nobody's not bowing down. And, and the music just kind of moves you emotionally to do it. And, and I think that's why that phrase gets repeated. So you get the picture. You have this impressive statue. You have an impressive gathering. All the who's who is there. And they're highly motivated when the music starts to bow down. Because if they don't, they'll be thrown into this apparently burning furnace. In fact, that's why verse 7 says, as soon as they heard the first note, they were down. Now, you would be down too, wouldn't you? I mean, it, it, maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you'd be like those three. But I mean, if, if you were just an ordinary bloke in the kingdom, that's what I'm thinking, you would, you would, when that first note struck, you were down. And that's what verse 7 actually says. When the music started, they all went down. But then the crowd looks around in stunned amazement from the statue to three guys over there that are still standing. The only three in the whole crowd that are still standing. They won't bow their heads. They won't bend their knees. Now, I think it's clear from this chapter that those three men had powerful enemies. Um, they had risen quickly through the ranks to positions of leadership in the kingdom, and they were outsiders. And as a result, there was jealousy. They had powerful enemies. And you read the rest of the story and Starting in verse eight, let's let's look at that. And and at this some time, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, "O king, live forever! You've issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that." Whoever doesn't fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there's some Jews here whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They don't pay any attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you've set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned these three. So the men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't serve my gods or worship the image of gold I've set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the, here it is again, horn, horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? That's a rhetorical question. He's not looking for information. He doesn't want an answer. He doesn't want suggestions. He, he basically saying nobody can rescue you from my hand. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he'll rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we'll not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you set up. Isn't that an incredible story? These guys, they make two Amazing statements about God. And, and I want you to see them because they're, they're really highlights in the text. The first one is in verse 17 where they say, The God we serve is able. Isn't that amazing? The God we serve is ama- able. He's not a myth. He's not an abstraction. He's not somebody's idea. He's the living, powerful God who is able to save us from the fiery furnace. Therefore, we don't need to live in fear. We don't need to cower. Every, everything and everybody has their limitations, but not our God. Our God is able. Your God is able. I thought about that this week. My dad died on Tuesday. It's interesting because last Sunday I came to church and there was no real sign that that would be imminent. I walked into my office and I and I felt like the Lord said, you need to read Psalm 116. So I read it before I came in here. And in the middle of that psalm, 
It's almost like it left off, leapt off the page. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, I'm smart enough in the Bible to know that that means carefully watched over is the death of God's people. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know why it impressed me. I do now. It's like God was giving me a heads up ahead of time. I, I came into the service here on Sunday, and it's funny, but I, I wasn't thinking about my dad. But in one of the worship songs, I began to pray because we were talking about heaven. I began to pray that God would somehow soon take my dad to heaven. And, and I did the services and went back to my office and kind of just sat back and thought, why did I say what I did? You know, pastors always go back and say, why did I say what I did? Why did I do that? Why did... So after I got that out of my system, I went home. And um, I got home and Ginny said, Marilyn called. Marilyn's my sister. And I called Marilyn and Marilyn said, I don't think dad will make it today. I said, you're kidding. What happened? She said, I don't know. I said, I'm coming up. And, and I called Wilma and said, get me on the screen at night because I'm, I'm going up to kill him. So I went up there. And I, I was um, up there sitting at his bedside with Marilyn last Sunday night. It's incredible. He's, he's lying there and he can't move and he can't respond. I don't know if he's conscious or unconscious. I think he's in some kind of state. His eyes are open, but it's like nobody's home. He's not talking, responding. He got these deep, deep breaths. And, you know, at some point they're going to stop. It's amazing when you sit there for hours, what goes through your head. You think about life and you think about death and you begin to rehearse all of the stories of your childhood and youth with your dad. And you remember crazy. I'm I'm like 58 years old. I'm old. But but I went back to when I was a little kid and I remembered something. My dad's arms are big. And if you saw his hands, they're twice my size. And he, he can't move his arms and his hands. He's not even t- He's just lying there. But I went back to when I was a kid. Five, four, six, I don't know. You know, we'd be at home. And, um, and I remember we'd always wait for my dad to come. And when the door would open, we would fly toward him. And he would hold out his arms. He would grab us and he'd throw us up in the air. It was, it was cool. We did it like almost every day. And he'd throw us up and... And, you know, the game was, will he catch us? But he would catch us, of course. And I think my brother was dropped on his head. But anyway, he would catch us. <clears throat> and, um, and, and I, why do you think about that when you're with your dad and you're 58 years old and he's dying? You know why? If you do, I don't. But I was reminded of Daniel 3. Because now he couldn't have... He couldn't have lifted his hand to shake mine if he wanted to. And I thought, a day comes when every human arm that you depend on fails. Not there anymore. Can't hold you up. When everything you're building your life on outside of God just isn't strong enough. And I thought, what a powerful statement embedded in Daniel 3 that our God is able. His arms don't get tired. They don't get weak. They don't stop working. They're still there. These guys made this most incredible statement. Our God is able. You can trust them to sustain you, to satisfy you, to protect you, to provide for you. And he'll never let you down. He is able to restore broken marriages, to liberate people from horrible addictions, to heal damaged bodies. He's able to forgive the darkest of sins and make that person into a new person, to provide for your greatest need. You know, if we were in a happy church, like a Pentecostal church, they'd be out of their seats by now. And you just look at me like deer caught in a headlight. I'm telling you really good stuff. They pay me a lot of money to tell you this. Our God is able. Really. Thank you. And if you can yell at a country song, certainly you can yell at that, right? I mean, our God is able. That's an amazing statement. So I I took a step back from the text. I said, how do you get there? How do you get to the place where you stand in front of the greatest power in the world who says, bow down, and you say, can't? 
Because I serve a greater God. How do you get to that place? I thought about that this week. I'm not sure, but I'll tell you what I think. These are very important if they're not the right things. Number one, you, you have to know God's word. You have to actually know it and believe it and have embraced it as part of your DNA. These Hebrew young people, they would have had to memorize great portions of the Pentateuch. That's The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They would have known by heart Exodus chapter 20. And because I don't, let me just read you this. They knew this stuff. Where God said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You you shouldn't make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. That would have been part of their DNA. They already knew that. That One of the things they knew about God is that he's jealous. And some of us don't understand that, but he is. And so that means you don't bow down to any other God or idol. And they weren't. I think you get where they are when you actually know God's word and believe it's real and embrace it. You know the second thing they did? It's so clear in chapter 3, it's implied in chapter 1, is they actually came to a point where they made a decision about how they were going to live their life. They weren't like so many people that were kind of living over here in the world, dabbling here, but then on Sunday in front of the table of the Lord, emotionally stirred and clapping their hands and, you know, whatever we do and, and, and living for God and then back into the world Monday. They, they said, you know what, you can live this way or you can live this way. How are we going to live? And they made a decision. Either way, there's a cost and they knew they'd pay a price. Seems to me they made a decision that if this word is true, God's word, then it's actually going to shape the way we live and we are going to reorient our lives, rearrange our lives around Jesus. And they did. And that's why they were able to stand up there and say, no, our God is able to rescue us. That's the first incredible statement out of their mouth. The second one takes your breath away. Now, Jesus aside, I don't think there's any character on the pages of this book, the Bible, that says anything more powerful than what these guys say next. Look at it. It's in, it's in um, well, I was way back in Exodus. Just talk among yourselves while I find Daniel again for a moment. Um, <clears throat> it's in Daniel 3, verse 18. It just takes your breath away. They say, um, this God is able to save us, but here it is. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you set up. That's a staggering statement. Our God is able, but if he chooses not to rescue us, we won't bow down. That's incredible faith, trust in a living God. I, um, I thought they must have prayed. They must have prayed that Nebuchadnezzar would change his mind. They must have prayed that the decree would not end up being enforced. They must have prayed that when they stayed standing, nobody else would notice. But they did. They noticed and they were in trouble. And they were now facing their worst case scenario. They said, no. And even if he doesn't, we won't bow down. They were like Job that said, and even if God slays me, I'll trust him. Or like Esther, who went to the king. And put her life on the line on behalf of her people and said, if I perish, I perish. Here's something to remember. Sometimes faith changes your circumstances. Sometimes you pray and you're healed. Sometimes you pray and your prodigal kid comes back home. Sometimes you pray and you get a job. Sometimes you pray and your marriage comes back together. Sometimes faith changes your circumstances. But if you turn that coin over, you know what you get? Sometimes faith doesn't change your circumstances. Sometimes you pray and you're not healed. Sometimes you pray and your kid doesn't come home. Sometimes you pray and your marriage falls apart. 
Sometimes faith changes your circumstances and sometimes it doesn't. Just read Hebrews 11. And when you read it, slow yourself way down at verse 35. It says in verse 35, others like mothers receive their dead back to life again. And then in the middle of the verse, but others, they were killed, sawed in half, changed. But then it says, but all of them were commended for their faith in God. That's very important to remember. Sometimes God saves you from the fire. But sometimes he chooses to save you in the fire. I mean, just listen to the story. Verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar, he's furious at these three. And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Now, in ancient literature... Proverbs, other wisdom literature, you'll, you'll read a phrase like seven times whatever. It doesn't mean that he cranked it up seven times. That phrase always means to the max, as hot as it could go. So Nebuchadnezzar heated this thing up as hot as it could go and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent And the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Well, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted out their names. Come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and all these other people stood around them and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. This guy's a piece of work. (coughs) Be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego again in the province of Babylon. Sometimes God saves you from the fire. Sometimes he leaves you in it, and it's frightening, and it's dangerous, and you don't know the outcome. But what you do know is that no matter what, you have his personal presence with you. He was there. Nebuchadnezzar said it's an angel. I think it was Jesus with them. I mean, doesn't Isaiah 43 say literally, if you walk through the fire, I will be in it with you. So he might not take you out of your rotten marriage or he might not choose to heal you of your depression. But I'll tell you what, he will walk with you and hold you by the right hand in it. And you have his personal guarantee that his presence will never leave you or never forsake you. That's amazing. So that's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many have never heard that story before? It, quite, a, quite a few. It's, I mean, you're way more literate than the first service, of course, so that's good. <laughs> but it's a great story. It's not just a Sunday school story where most of us heard it. It's, it's way more. So let's come back to our question. How are Christ followers to live in an ungodly world? Answer, faithfully. But what does faithfully actually look like in the real world? There's a negative side to it and a positive. Let's think about that. The negative side is this. They're not to bow down to other gods. To live faithfully is actually not to bow down to other gods. As Christians in the West, we're we're not confronted with a literal 90-foot statue that's nine feet wide and coated with gold and 
having the country music play and we all have to bow down to this thing. It doesn't work that way, but there's no end of idols in our culture that are calling us to bow down to them. In fact, it was John Calvin that said the human heart is an idol factory. Isn't that true? There's an endless number of them. I've just represented some of them up here on the stage, but there's a whole lot more. Let me just look at some of them. There's the um, the idol of power uh, and control, maybe represented by that airplane of that car, or maybe it's just um, riches. A lot of people bow down to that idol, don't they? And then there's the idol of, well, stuff. We just People like to accumulate stuff. And some of you here today just can't stop accumulating and somehow need to learn how to de-accumulate. But that can be an idol, too. Um, then there's the idol of money. And we know what that's like. A lot of people try and build their life on that. You don't have to have a lot to trust in it, do you? You just have to have a, want a lot to be able to trust in it. And then there's the, the, the lips back there. Now, I, I had a, a war with, not a war, I just had a disagreement with some people here. And I, this was the idol for me of sex. Well, not for me, but for some people. It's, uh, this is the idol of sex. Let's just leave it there. And um, you know, I had ideas of how we should do this. They said, this won't stumble anybody. I said, you're right. And, and so there it is. It could represent sex. A lot of people bow down to that God, don't they? There are uh, other people, though, that, could be represented by that. And actually, it's a very, very good depiction of this idol as I think about it, because it also could just be a relationship. There are some people that make an idol out of another person or a relationship, and they can't let that person go. And then other people, there's the idol of sports. That, that guy looks like he's worshiping, doesn't he? He's obviously not at a Calgary Flames game. But anyway, he's <clears throat> <clears throat> there are people that worship sports. Get this. I don't know if you can believe this. There are people with kids whose kids are in hockey. Do you know what? They actually, some of them, if it comes to hockey or church, hockey trumps church. And their kids learn that that's more important than being in the presence of the living God. It's a God in central Alberta. It really is. Um, then that guy over there, I just thought that just that's the idol of self. Just me. I, I mean, <laughs> well, not me, maybe you, but I just just kind of self generally. It's we're, I think at the bottom of everything, that's it, isn't it? If we had a choice, we would be God. I, you could multiply pictures of idols, but it seems to me. That if we're to live faithfully, we've got to choose not to bow down to the gods of our culture, whatever they might be. They all can be good in and of themselves. I mean, I mean, it's not wrong to be in a position of power or influence if God puts you there. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have stuff. It's not wrong to be grateful for the life God gave you. It's not wrong to have sex or relationship in the boundaries God has established, is it? Sports is a good thing. But it's when these things become an idol, and an idol is a person or a thing that you're most concerned about, think the most about, or affects your life the most. Anything that trumps God is an idol. So when Daniel calls us to live faithfully in 2012 in central Alberta, he's calling us to be ruthless in identifying the idols in our life and putting them in their rightful place and letting Jesus Christ have his rightful place in our hearts. So the negative part of living faithfully is not bowing down to idols. The positive side is then placing your trust in the living God. The king said about these guys that they trusted in God and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. They trusted in him. Where's your trust? This is very important. Listen to this. Trust in Jesus Christ defines what it is to be a Christian. That defines what it is to be a Christian. You're not a Christian because you're here. 
You're not a Christian because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You're not a Christian because you believe he died for your sins. You are not a Christian because you believe he rose from the dead. You're not a Christian if that makes you raise your hands and cry. Because the Bible says Satan does all that and he's not a Christian. He knows who Jesus is. He believes he died. He believes he was raised from the dead. And he shudders when he thinks about that. He's impacted emotionally. What makes you a Christian? When your belief becomes trust and you personally trust Jesus Christ with your very life. Trust is placing yourself in his hands, putting your whole life in his hands, saying my security will be Jesus Christ. My um, right to determine the outcomes of my life will be his call. The desires that I have that long to be satisfied, I trust him to satisfy them. I'll put myself in his hands to protect, provide, work out his purposes in my life. Trust in Jesus Christ literally defines what it is to be a Christian. To live faithfully. To identify the idols in your life and take them and lay them at the foot of the cross. By that I mean, God, this is the thing I was trusting in to give me pleasure, satisfaction, significance, whatever. But by putting it at the foot of your cross, I'm saying that what you did on the cross was more important. You're more important. You'll now be the one that becomes a foundation for my whole life. And then to live faithfully is to trust Jesus Christ. To say with an act like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will trust in him because he's able. And even if he doesn't deliver us, we'll still trust him. Because he's all wise and he's good. And as Ken said up here earlier, his love lasts a long, long time. What, what better way could there be to sort of act on this stuff than coming to a table of communion? Where you have bread or cracker that represents bread in a cup. You know, when you come to this table... You're saying both of those things. You, you're saying that I'm turning away from all of the gods that have grabbed my heart and I'm declaring that Jesus is Lord. And I trust him. And what he did 2,000 years ago, I, I trust that it was adequate for me today and for all of the stuff in my life. And I trust him to deliver on his promise that he can give life like nobody else has ever been able to give it, life to the full. I trust him. When he puts bread in your hand and a cup in the other hand, it's visual, it's real. It, it says to you, I really did what I did, and I really mean what I mean when I say that your sins have all been forgiven. And I, I, I've, I've taken care of it, your debt has been paid. And when you eat it and when you drink it, you are saying, and I embrace that. And Jesus will be my life, my strength, my everything. So... We're going to invite you in a moment to come up and we'll, we'll serve you up front and, you know, like we often do. And just when you're ready, you come up and you take bread and you take the cup and then make your way back to your seat. And um, when we all have it, we'll eat it and drink it together. But in the time that you have to reflect, why don't you ask the Holy Spirit if there's any idol or anything you're trusting that actually grieves him? And would you... Ask him to help you to rearrange your life around Jesus. That might mean that you need counsel. Because it's a big deal if you've kind of gone down these roads a long way to, to stop and turn around. You might need help. But he can give you wisdom. It might simply be just this simple prayer when you have the bread and cup in your hand. Jesus, you died for my sins and I trust you. And I've gone down some bad roads, but I'm turning around. I don't even know what that looks like, but I take this bread and take this cup and I will do whatever it takes to walk toward you. He'll, like he'll take you at that. Some of you here today have actually given up on yourself. Do you know that? And it's like, you don't even know why you're here. It's kind of a last resort, but you're here. I said to Jesus not so long ago, I said, I'm done, finished. Busted, broken, empty. I said, I do not want to preach one more time. I said, I just, I don't have anything left to give. And I said, I keep, you know, 
I battle with stuff, Jesus. And, and sometimes it gets the best of me. And I don't know how to get to where, like, I should be. I'm finished with myself. You know what he said to me? I've been waiting to hear that a long time. And I'm glad you're finished with yourself, he said. He said, are you finished with me? And it kind of shocked me. I said, well, no. Well, he said, if you're finished with yourself, that's a really good thing. He said, why don't you trust me? Then he said, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I'll teach you how to do life. At 39 Ramage in 2012 in Red Deer, Alberta. And I said, that's a pretty good deal. He's saying that to some of you today because you're saying, I'm done. I can't make this work. And he said, I've been waiting a long time to hear you say that. So why don't you take the bread and take the cup and trust me, is what he's saying. He has never, never let anybody down that's trusted him. And nobody that's trusted him has ever been put to shame. Isn't that good news? So let me pray for the bread and for the cup. Then invite you to come up when you're ready. Take it. Let's grab our seat again and then, then we'll celebrate together with the bread and the cup. Father, thank you today that we can be here. So good to worship you. We love to be in your presence with your people singing praises and to celebrate with all of our hearts. That's a good thing. Father, we thank you for your word because it, it actually stops us in our tracks and makes us think again. And your Holy Spirit shepherds us through your word back into your presence. So we thank you. I pray that whatever you put in our hearts today, we wouldn't lose. But like Sean said a few weeks ago, that that you would find our hearts like good seed where your or good soil, rather, where your word can take root and we wouldn't lose it. We pray, Father, as we sit around this table, that you would remind us of the great cost that you paid for our salvation. None of us will pay the price that you paid. We thank you for the bread because Peter said that in your body, Lord Jesus, on the cross, you bore our sins. And Peter said that the cup represents your precious blood. And that that's what redeems us from an empty, meaningless, end of the day, zero kind of life. Lord Jesus, thank you for life to the full. And so we celebrate your abundant goodness, the fact that you not only died, but you were raised from the dead. And today you're the living Lord. We thank you in your name. Amen.